Uh, we have here uh, a picture of a mosque, but also Cairo include in its population uh, Christian and uh, Jewish uh, communities. Uh, yes. Here we have so, two uh, examples. Um, can you tell us uh, about these uh, two religious uh, structures? What do they tell about the integration of the religious minorities in Cairo at that time? Yeah, um, there is a really interesting book before I start to dive into this question, which is come out in uh, 2020 by Mahmoud Mamdani. It's called Neither Settler Nor Native, uh, which goes into really an interesting analysis of this idea of the making of minorities from uh, European, Imperial, British, most uh, often uh, point of view. I'd like to contrast that with what was going on in a place like Egypt, which is actually, I mean, if you think about what happened um, in light of what was for decades called the process of decolonization, even though now, you know, after many decades, we know, oh, that was an American backed crew. So not so much for decolonization, right? I mean, it's really interesting. Egypt does not have a monument for uh, independence. Uh, there's not one monument for independence, which should make us think a lot about what is independence, what is decolonization, has it ever actually happened, or has this all been one big episode of gaslighting? But one of the side effects of this has been the deintegration of various communities that were part of this place. So, you know, the creation of a Zionist, uh, European Zionist uh, state that identified as the Jewish state came at the expense of Jewish communities all across the Arab world, for example, many of whom were lead architects, ministers, um, investors, bankers, you know, were doing quite well off uh, for themselves. Not everyone, of course, some were also poor, but, uh, you know, the idea that there was a deeply integrated uh, community that can actually, I mean, where can you do this in Europe? There were families in Egypt in the 20th century, Jewish families in Egypt in the 20th century that can actually trace their lineage all the way to the 8th century. Um, I don't think you could do that in many for many Jewish families in Europe, um, and that that was gone. At the you know that was one of the side effects of creating this project. Um, the same was with various other communities. So, for example, when we see at the same time the partition of India and Pakistan, you know the Hindus here, the the, the Muslims there, um, these are imperial uh, policies that came that I think were motivated by um, imperial individuals who come from societies that were quite monochromatic, <laughs> they were white and there were only one dominant identity. Um, so when you look at these structures, A, they're quite, um, these are not small structures. Yeah. You know, I remember, I remember in New York, the big fight about opening a new mosque um, in, after 9-11 and like the, how that was such a big deal. And I don't even know if it happened or not. But you know, these are recent debates in which uh, a minority was literally struggling to have a religious building in New York City, <laughs> right? The Big Apple, everybody is mixed in there supposedly yeah. and living happily ever after. Not the case, but here are these big monumental structures, not by colonial individuals, but by deeply integrated communities who are you know, living in the city and they are part of it and they're proudly showing their identities, their religious identities and whatnot. So for example, the, um, the kind of um, Tuscan inspired the church is for an Italian um, Catholic community. Mm -hmm. um, both architects who built it were also Italian who are based in Egypt um, and the synagogue uh, is the same is designed by uh, two individuals both of whom are Kyrian they are not imported they're not associated with colonial entities of any sort uh, both of these are in downtown in prominent locations quite large in scale um, and I think it is the present this is when I say architecture is evidence against narratives that are quite dominant today to facilitate certain um, ongoing imperial narratives that say, you know, this place has always been at war or these communities have always not coexisted or, well, it's really hard to argue that when you have a massive synagogue in the middle of downtown Cairo or an enormous Italian style church that was not colonially associated, that is in the middle of this ca Egyptian Muslim dominant supposedly capital, right? Um... In the 20th uh, century, uh, Cairo attracted artists, singers, uh, actors who would try uh, their luck uh, in the city. And in 1935, the construction of Studio Musser was completed in the outskirts of the city, while the exhibition grounds, uh, which is now the Opera Grounds, established in Tahrir Square in Zamalek a year later. Um, uh, 
how these two projects symbolize the ambition of uh, Cairo to impose itself as an artistic and cultural hub in the Arab mm. Well, there's, it's really interesting that you've put the, I really like actually that you've done this part of, instead of me doing my own version, just this actually brings things to my attention that I didn't necessarily even realize that these two projects were happening more or less at the same time. I think it's fascinating that um, the history of cinema, for example, um, yeah, uh, um, you know, because the history of modernity or the way modernity is narrated in general continues to be quite white supremacist and Eurocentric, um, you know, the, the impact of other places like Egypt, and I, and I put other here kind of in bold, other places uh, like Egypt or Cairo, uh, is always minimized. Um, so the fact that, you know, Egypt has really a, or quite an early um, a contribution to cinema before the establishment of Studio Must, we're talking from late 19th century, early 1920, uh, early 1900s, uh, with experiments happening in Alexandria studios. I mean, Alexandria was the main film uh, yeah. city, film studio city um, early on in the century. So by the time you get Studio Must in the early 1930s, it is building already on almost three decades of experience with cinema in Egypt, let alone what was going on elsewhere uh, in, in, in the world, most likely in Europe, in this case, what we're talking about. Um, uh, and this actually has to do with the conditions, you know, the light and so on, which was what the technology needed, uh, needed a lot of light. I mean, early film studios looked like greenhouses because um, you needed to let in a lot of light in order for the image to be captured. And um, so Egypt provided this place. So it was a natural place for this industry to, to make its place. Of course, with uh, a bourgeois class that um, w wants entertainment uh, with, um, I mean, also the relationship between Egyptian cinema and theater. Egypt had a quite a thriving theater um, field. Um, also, again, from the second half of the 19th century to the, for, until Studio Masters opened, a lot of the early actors uh, were actually theater people who then transitioned to the silver screen. So, so I think this context is important because it is easy to look at an image like Studio Mostra and say this is an imposed or imported or transferred modernity. And that would be a narrative that would be at the expense of this kind of thing, what I just described, that we are talking about something that emerged over a course of time. Parallel to this is industry. Uh, so cinema was, and by the time we did Studio Must was kind of becoming an industry and it was founded by or funded by the same um, national bank that was the first Egyptian owned uh, bank, a uh, bank mist, a main contributor to the finances of this studio as the industries that were then also presented in the industrial fairs represented by the picture um, on the right. So, so um, if we think of colonialism as something that's actually, uh, or imperialism in general, uh, as something that's much more interested in, you know, the management of resources and capital and markets and so on, the emergence of an Egyptian economy that's Egyptian owned with Egyptian shareholders um, did come then to produce uh, the outputs that would come, you know, Egyptian cinema, Egyptian industry. And so it's interesting to actually put those two next to each other because they are happening more or less at the same time. Um, and it's, in, yeah, I mean, the, the architecture, um, because the question of style came up earlier uh, when we were talking about Seyed Karim, interestingly, you know, style is never actually part of the conversation um, because identity wasn't uh, at the forefront. I mean, style is kind of uh, the architectural uh, expression of uh, a fixed notion of identity. Uh, instead, what Seyed Karim was saying in that quote is modern solutions to modern problems. So you want to build a studio like the question of identity or style would be completely irrelevant. You need to build a building with a certain amount of dimension to allow for a stage that's a certain kind of size, to allow a certain amount of light. These are the issues that are then produced in the architecture. Um, and I think this is interesting to always think about um, why style um, becomes such an important notion later on because of its imposition in art historical narratives uh, looking back at this period. I mean, I, the tree of architecture has is, is always been a useful reference to go back to, which I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with, but it's uh, um, uh, Bannister Fletcher uh, produced this book uh, about basically the history of architecture, late 19th century, it was in print well into the 20th century. I believe it's still in print, which is wild, um, and it keeps up being updated. And in, for a long time, it included this tree of architecture uh, 
illustration, which essentially was about styles and, you know, um, you know, Chinese, Peruvian, Mexican and Egyptian and Saracenic, which is Islamic um, styles were kind of just reduced and flattened into these simplified forms. And then they were all represented by dead tree branches. Whereas the bark of the tree goes from ancient Greece and Rome yeah. to an inversion, um, um, the flat iron building in New York City as the, you know, the pinnacle of, of um, and that's obviously a very problematic problem, <laughs> representation of history and humanity altogether. Uh, but that is what drives a lot of um, architectural production up until today in places like the Gulf and the Middle East in general, especially when they're done by foreign offices that are because of their, you know, the, you know, diplomatic missions in places like the Gulf and even in Egypt. I always like to tell the story of how a Nazi architect came to build the main stadium in Cairo because his embassy helped that happen in the 1950s. You know, like this is quite wild. So the relationship between these foreign offices and designers and the diplomatic missions in these um, locales, what are these architects who are not from the context have no relation to the, what the context have to pull from? They have to pull from things like style, which is always going to be reduced and uh, simplified and flattened. Um, so none of this is really part of the conversation of the people who are building the structures that we see on the screen now. Uh, in 1952, the Free Officers Revolution overthrew King Farouk and Gamal Abdel Nasser, who later become the president of the Republic of Egypt. Uh, the country became a central, uh, central actor in the geopolitics in the Middle East. Um, and the headquarters of the League of Arab States is uh, still uh, in Cairo. Mm -hmm. But I choose these uh, two uh, buildings because I'd like you to tell us, in terms of architecture, how these uh, two buildings indicate the new socialist uh, power. Um, and the fact that they are in downtown, uh, was there um, an idea? Or, uh, by President Nasser to reinvest downtown Cairo, whose urban uh, planning was uh, related to the Khedivet period. Yeah. So um, again, uh, it, it is important to use what we know now, which is uh, what we have been told or we've told ourselves always is a revolution was actually an American Baptist coup. This is important to keep on because that helps us reread this whole period. Um, you know, um, Adam Curtis has this interesting point of view on the Cold War, which is basically that it really served the Americans to inflate the, uh, the Eastern Bloc's power uh, in many ways in order to actually have more reason for particular kind of military uh, power to be built on the American side of things. So uh, I just say this as a side note or as a footnote, because what was really socialism in the context of Egypt in the 1950s? Um, I wouldn't even think of the Arab League building as having anything to do with socialism whatsoever. I think what we're looking at is an architecture of the times, uh, in the case of the Arab League building with even decorative elements that wouldn't necessarily fit it in any particular uh, sociopolitical approach. Um, Oftentimes, what I'm finding is that budgets uh, and the limitations of uh, funds uh, are often what shapes a lot of what gets built. So you, you're being asked as an architect to build large scale structures for big institutions that are brand new in most cases, but oftentimes um, you need to provide a lot of square footage for very little money. And a lot of these architects were not making money themselves, by the way. Um, you know, a lot of them died poor. And this is something that we don't necessarily think of. Um, and so, um, you know, these two buildings are actually by the same architect, Mahmoud Riyadh, and it was part of a remaking of the uh, Nile front side of downtown Cairo by the Nasser regime. Um, but I feel like the regime here is more of a client than, let's say, in other contexts where let's, you know, I don't know, to use an extreme example, Nazi Germany, you know, where uh, the regime and the architecture produced uh, were closely tied. In this case, that wasn't necessarily the case, or, you know, there wasn't a kind of an architectural idiom that the Nasser regime was invested in as such that architects were simply manifesting. There were architects who had to provide solutions to commissions that they were asked, uh, and it just happens to be under regime that's presenting itself as revolutionary. So it served um, 
at the time it served that regime um, by creating a kind of a physical narrative, yeah. a spatial narrative uh, that remakes uh, society's conception of itself. Um, but in terms of the aesthetics of these buildings, I, I would not give too much credit to whatever political agenda was on the table, because even you know that political agenda was never really that clear is what I'm trying to say. And oftentimes it was really at the end, uh, the product of, uh, of an architect's whimsy still as architecture oftentimes ends up being, uh, you know, trying to balance your budget, your site, your program, and what you feel like designing these days, you know, these kind of are what shape the, the outcome of the building. With the politics of liberalization by the successor of uh, President uh, Nasser Anwar al-Sadat, uh, Egypt saw the multiplication of constructions like hotels. Um, why did you choose uh, yeah, to talk about these, uh, uh, this type of uh, structure? And mm -hmm. can we say that the mass tourism uh, also affected the urban uh, uh, landscape of Cairo? Yeah, that's a great question because, um, you know, you go to, so the economy grows through a massive, I mean, um, a transition is not even a, a proper word to use here, uh, a, a blow, it's a, it's a big, um, impact on the majority of the population, which meant there's a massive wealth transfer that went on, which is very relevant for us today to think about. Um, and of course, wealth transfer means creating new, a new class of people, fewer people with more uh, access to resources. And those resources are then managed to serve certain interests. And a lot of those individuals, um, I mean, so one of the first things that Sadat does is basically imprison or exile most of the free officers that he was a part of, right? And it's called the 15th May revolution, silent revolution, whatever, however people like to call it. But essentially, he was bought out by the Americans. Uh, and it's really interesting when I was doing my timeline, you know, Nixon goes to Egypt and goes to China like one year apart. And these things are happening together. And this is why actually it's really interesting to zoom in and out in thinking about these different, um, well, the different cities and countries and the relationship to shifting, um, you know, global networks of power of who's in charge of what. Um, and so Egypt then becomes kind of pigeonholed as this cute old place. Uh, so tourism is number one, you know, all the industries uh, are privatized and then sold for scraps. Um, so no longer it's a place that makes, it's a place that consumes. It's a place that is a market for imported things. It's a place that doesn't grow its own food. It's a place that imports food, you know, wheat and so on. And so that completely transforms the physical landscape. Um, that means that fewer people are in charge of their own lives. They are dependent now on new networks of power and, and, and money. Um, and, you know, tourism becomes... Uh, which is very different than travel that exists. I would say up until the 60s, it wasn't even tour like yeah. traveling to Egypt in the 1960s and traveling to Egypt in the 1970s are two very different experiences. Um, and yeah, so the realm of tourism enters and suddenly you get these massive hotels. Um, you know, you, you go from, you know, historic hotels. So Egypt had some of the earliest purpose-built hotels in the world because of its importance in sort of the landscape of travel internationally from the 19th century. A lot of those were demolished, some of which were demolished as recently as in the last 10 years. Imagine, you know, some of the earliest purpose-built hotels in the world get demolished in the 2020s or the 2010s. Um, uh, not all, again, as far as I'm concerned, from a historical point of view, I think it's to erase evidence. Well, one way to think about it is a lot of those hotels actually served as headquarters for colonial authorities. So that's one thing. And what's interesting is, you know, the first uh, in the 1950s, uh, one of the first things that gets built is a Hilton hotel. Um, so that's already kind of an indication of a shift. So while publicly we're being told a narrative about uh, revolution, uh, a regime that's anti-imperial, that isn't following the interest of, let's say, the United States, one of the first monuments is a Hilton Hotel. Uh, and it's the second in the world. And it's the place where the spies and kings get to meet and make deals. Um, and then by the 70s, you get another wave, you know, you're looking at another Hilton at the tower. Uh, and so you get another wave of these hotels as, you know, tourism uh, and cheaper air travel becomes. Uh, so here we have uh, three uh, structures, uh, the Egyptian Museum, 
from 1902, the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization uh, constructed between 1984 and 2017. And the uh, third picture is the Grand Egyptian Museum uh, projected in 2022. Uh, so three different museums, three different dates, but the same uh, history. So can you tell us how the understanding of the national history has evolved in Egypt? That's, that's a huge question. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if I'm even uh, equipped to, to, to give a sufficient answer, but I'll, I'll try through these buildings. I think with the first example, there's, a, there's an interesting, these are interesting to look at together um, because they each have actually a story that has to do with their design, the building design. So actually let me focus maybe on that as a way yeah. of answering your question. So, uh, oh, and all three were um, the outcomes of competitions. Mm -hmm. which is really interesting to also think about. Um, you know, one of the first big uh, international competitions was held by Egypt in the 19th century, in the late 19th century for the Egyptian Museum. And the entries were quite wild and diverse, mostly by, I think there were 15. Um, and I think all of them, the ones that were uh, allowed to be finalists were all European um, designs. Uh, which has a lot to do with what was going on at the time, but also the very strong grip hold of Europeans on Egyptology and archaeology in general. And by the way, this is a story that you find all across the colonial world uh, where Europeans really were um, sidelining uh, any locals from um, archaeological, um, there's kind of an obsession about the history of humanity and archaeology being a tool to document this history, but obviously that being implicated also with ongoing debates around evolution or whatever was going on and uh, notions of white supremacy that maybe at the time were not called white supremacy, but ultimately everything was kind of, you know, building up uh, kind of like the tree of architecture, the pinnacle of which was, you know, the flat iron, the parallel of that within archaeology would be, you know, look at all these societies, they did great things in the past, and then here's, you know, the white man in Europe, and so on. So even though the history of Egypt needed to be represented within a building, um, almost all the entries had really um, European presentation, uh, and all the architects that were allowed to be finalists were quite European. Um, one of them, I mean, looked like it was like the Reichstag, you know, it's quite ridiculous, <laughs> a massive dome, or like St. Peter's, uh, and luckily that didn't get built. Um, but um, that's maybe one thing to say on the design of the Egyptian museum, the competition, and, you know, the inclusion of Egyptian figures on the facade are also very sort of Europeanized, romanticized representation of a, of a Egyptianized female uh, body. The middle project has a really interesting story. It was also a competition uh, that was related to, believe it or not, the story really begins uh, in the 60s with the relocation of the Abu Simbel temples. With that project, there was an intent to create two museums, one which became the Luxor Museum. Um, am I right on this? Oh, no, the Nubia Museum, I'm sorry. The Nubia Museum in Aswan. Um, and then the second was a museum of Egyptian civilization, which, by the way, wasn't the first time that such a museum uh, existed in, um, we don't know exactly, or at least I don't know exactly the, the date, but in the 1930s, it appears in photos, there was a museum of Egyptian civilization in what is today the opera complex. Um, and actually, you can still see the sign faded um, until today. Um, and so this Egyptian was meant to be also in the opera complex, and this design was designed for that site. And what's interesting, one of the anecdotes that I you know, learned in the process of the research is that uh, things changed. I guess uh, Suzanne Mubarak, who was the patron of the project, uh, didn't like the location or something happened. So they took the design as is and they moved it to another site, which is actually where it got built today in Fustat. Um, and this is where recently the sort of the extravagant display of uh, power and <laughs> Egyptian something, uh, you know, this parade of the mummies that happened with President Sisi walking down this sort of never ending hallway to, you know, announce the inauguration of the museum. This is the site of, of that event. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
It's only partially opened. Uh, it is an Egyptian architect who won the competition. I don't have really much else to say um, uh, on the design of this building. The third example, the design, I think I have something to say about it, which is which has to do also with the involvement of power, the military in this case, um, which has taken over the construction of the, of the Grand Egyptian Museum, which has been going on for quite some time. I think it's quite controversial still for a lot of people. Uh, given that it is meant to be a new home for the collection that is in the first building in the in the in this slide, um, and it is meant to be opened uh, at least later this year, um, which is the hundredth anniversary of the discovery of the Tutankhamun um, tomb with all of its uh, treasures. So there's kind of a lot of these weird, interesting uh, historical intersections. But the design was a competition again, uh, one of the largest I think in, in history. Uh, with hundreds of entries and um, what you're looking at is not exactly what got built and it's really interesting how these like pyramidal forms appear over and over and over uh, something about the touristification of Egypt post 1970s also comes with the flattening of what it means to be Egyptian and then what forms are meant to represent that thing that is Egypt with all of its complexity and triangles just keep appearing over and over and over uh, it's almost like asking a two-year-old you know Egypt so they'll do this you know <laughs> and then so let's build museums around that simplistic notion um but yeah, I mean, the facade looks quite different. What 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 was built or what is actually now built uh, looks rather different than, than that. So I, I don't really have much else to say on this, but yeah, museums are really uh, in the context of what we're talking about where tourism's main um, consumer in mind is um, someone who's never been to Egypt who's gonna pass through for a week, not, for example, here in Mexico, uh, there was a, quite a, a strong museum building program that was very much, aimed at Mexicans. All the signage actually is in, our, is in Spanish, which I think is quite amazing because yes, there are international tourists and yes, maybe some signage uh, should uh, help them understand what they're looking at. But the main client, the main consumer, the main user is the Mexican. That's not the case in Egypt, um, since the seventies at least. And I would say since before that, um, given the European domination of Egyptology, which is, has a long history and is ongoing. That would be my last question. Um, in the introduction of your book, you wrote modernism in Egypt has not been granted national heritage status, as if history stopped at the threshold of the 20th century. So what do you think about the challenges to resolve uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue? And especially nowadays in the preservation and restoration of the buildings in downtown Cairo? Yeah, I mean, that's a very selective uh, approach to restoration. Um, I, I, Egypt doesn't have, for example, a school that teaches people proper restoration, like architectural restoration, management, building management, store, the management of buildings. Um, there's no degrees really that are given to the, you, you, you don't have a conservator, building conservation degree that you can get, which is ironic given that there's so much to conserve all the time. But it also fits with, I think, is a very British notion of, um, it's a very British imperial notion of what, um, how to preserve tradition in this kind of frozen way. If we go back to the very beginning of this conversation, when I gave the example of, of the Gulf and these like very simplified notions of what it means to have a particular identity and tie it to a national story that's very simplified. Well, I think, you know, after centuries of genocidal action by Europeans in which you know entire cultures were wiped out with their buildings and knowledge and books and so on and so on, there was a shift sometime in the last couple of hundreds of years in which, okay, we don't kill everybody, we leave a little bit of some of something. So you know we're not going to erase the entire city, but we'll keep you know a few iconic structures and then everything else is kind of like fair game uh, for investors, for you know military juntas, for whoever is helping us uh, today. And that's actually what I, that's how I see it when I look at what's going on in Egypt up until today, which is this very selective restoration that's meant to give you kind of like a little, it's like a, it's like a, a moose bush of uh, a, a culture, you know, like here is a bite of Islamic architecture, here's a bite of Coptic architecture, here's a bite of, uh, you know, whatever, but modern never really enters this, uh, however many course meal of architectural um, things to digest uh, in a place. Um, 
So, and I think part of this identity is fitted, fits within this narrative that somehow there's a break that's been made between, so the, the notion of a, a, an accumulative, simmering, continuous, layering, multifaceted history uh, in places like Egypt or the Arab world or Latin America even or so on, you know, these don't really fit these reductive top-down visions of these places by mostly Europeans or Americans today, uh, you know, that want these easily digestible chapters and episodes of, it's like watching a series. Um, and so a lot of what I think has been happening has been, you know, the simplification, the disentangling, the uh, the, the out of context maintenance of individual structures may be a small area, not even, you know, but not, but it's never really, you know, preservation policies that were carried out in post World War II Europe will never be allowed really to take place in places outside of Europe. I mean, you can have entire cities uh, reconstructed from the rubble uh, in Central Europe or in Europe or whatever, wherever else. Um, um, to give you the illusion that everything has been okay forever. And actually, this is one of the funny things, again, with the Ukraine story, is I'm seeing journalists saying things like, this is not a war-torn place. We've never had wars here. I don't know, thinking to myself, Europe has never had wars? <laughs> you know, but like, it's very easy for a journalist to talk to an audience of millennials and tell them something like this. Um, when you can go to, uh, you know, some Polish town and walk around and have the illusion that everything has always been okay. Look, we have all well, even though it's all been reconstructed after World War II to maintain a certain narrative. That kind of approach has just not been, not because the money is not there, not because the desire for it has not been there. All the outcry in Egypt for all the demolitions that are ongoing or in other places or in Mecca, it's all locals who themselves are not given voice, who are silenced, who are not allowed to, you know, if you are an Egyptian conservator architect or just a normal person and you want to buy uh, a 19th century house or an 18th century a 17th century house, God forbid, in Egypt and fix it at your own expense, the amount of legal hurdles and permits that you might not even ever be able to get. Uh, so nothing encourages that process. And the result has been a total flattening of um, ident identities of, of places. Um, all the parts of these demolished buildings, if we're lucky, will get purchased by maybe a museum in Europe, maybe a private collection in the Gulf, and we'll never get to see it again. A door here, a window there, there's a kind of a scattering of material evidence, uh, which is actually one of the things that where I think architecture, interestingly, uh, you know, parallels what we see with, what, with, with what goes on with art and art collections, um, is how everything sort of is seen through the lens of money all of a sudden. It's no longer about the expression, it's no longer about the history, it's no longer about the context, it's how much is it worth, when it's put on the auction uh, at Sotheby's. Yeah. And that's really a sad approach to thinking about our reality. Thank you so much, Hamad, for your participation in this uh, panel. It was really great to hear you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank it's been a pleasure. So Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.